the building of the Kaaba. The story is well known to you. And it was that the Prophet ﷺ was around 35 years old. Ibn Ishaq says he was 35 years old. The Kaaba was damaged by two things in the year before it was rebuilt. The first, a fire. The second, a flood. SubhanAllah. And so they decided that they need to rebuild the entire Kaaba. Both damages had done. The fire weakened it. And then the flood pretty much destroyed the structure, even leaving some remnants here and there. It so happened that when the Kaaba was destroyed, there was a news of a sale going on in the city of Jeddah. At the time, they called it Judda. And what had happened was that the Caesar of Rome had sent supplies to one of the cities of Yemen to build a massive church over there. So he got the best wood and the best marble and the best craftsmen to go and build that church in Yemen. But Allah had another plan. And so the books of Sirah mentioned that Allah sent a wind off the coast of Judah to cause the ship to basically crash and the ship was damaged, but it just made it to Jeddah because Allah has a plan. And so the Quraysh, when they heard about this, they gathered together all their wealth and they went to Jeddah to purchase all of this and to hire the craftsmen as well to come. They're wondering now, the Kaaba is in semi-destroyed state in front of them. And they're wondering, should we come and destroy it? This is the house of Allah. They've never destroyed the house of Allah before. I mean, even the thought of it is sacrilegious, right? They don't know what to do. And according to one report of Ibn Ishaq mentions this, that when they were debating what to do, a large snake came out of the well of Zamzam. And it was rumored that there was a snake living in the well of Zamzam. Now this large snake came out, massive snake. And anytime they approached it, hissed at them. And so they wondered, what are they supposed to do? And Allah sent a big bird to pick up the snake and to get rid of it, to throw it behind one of the mountains of Mecca. So they took this as a sign that they should approach the Kaaba. And so they're, each one is nudging the other for, why don't you go first? Why don't you go first? Because they're worried what's going to happen. Until finally, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira finally said, Khalas, I'm going to do it. Hand me the axe. So he took the axe and he marched towards the Kaaba and he started breaking down one of the walls of the Kaaba. Nobody lifted a finger to help. Then the rumor spread. Why don't we use Al-Walid as the litmus test? If he survives the night, we'll join him the next day. Then the next morning, he woke up fine and healthy, everything's fine. So they said, okay, alhamdulillah. And so Al-Walid put one wall down. And so the next day, alhamdulillah, the entire Quraysh decided now we all have to tear the Kaaba down and then rebuild it. And what they did was they divided all of the tribes into four groups based on their lineage. The closest tribes together, you get this wall. Another close group, you get this wall. So the Banu Abd al-Manaf is given the most prestigious and that's the side of the wall. Why? Because they are the most prestigious. They knew it. Abdul Muttalib was from them. And Abdul Muttalib was he, who he was. So they get the most prestigious. The second most prestigious, the Banu Makhzum. Abu Jahl is from this tribe, right? The Banu Makhzum, they get the wall that is the Rukn Yamani to the Black Stone. The last fourth of the Kaaba. So they get the second most prestigious wall. And then their other tribes, we don't have to mention their names, they get the, the other two walls. Now, you all know what happened. The Banu Abd al-Manaf and the Banu Makhzum are raising the corner that has the black stone, right? The black stone doesn't belong to either wall, it belongs to both. And so when they get to that area, trouble brews. Why? Because the Banu Makhzum and the Banu Abd al-Manaf are rivals. They remained rivals. So both of them said, put their foots down. They said, the black stone is my side. No, it's my side. And then the other tribes also put and said, why should you get the privilege? This is a special stone. Now the Arabs knew that the black stone was a special stone, even in the days pre-Islam. So can you imagine for five days, heated arguments, they almost came to blows. The Banu Makhzum secretly put together a, an agreement with some other sub-tribes that they would fight to death to put the black stone in. They were almost about to reach to blows. On the fifth day, they all came together. And Abu Umayyah ibn al-Mughira, he said, there will be no bloodshed. We're not going to fight over this. Let us just give it over to the first person who enters from the door. There was one major door, uh, the one major area we can say. They didn't have a physical door. One area that you would come in when you would do tawaf. Whoever enters the first, he will be his decision. Now, what this basically meant for them was it's the luck of the draw. It's lottery system. Whoever walked in, who would he vote for for his own tribe? Because nobody would ever choose somebody else's tribe. It's just humanly impossible for them to think like that. So what they did was they then said, whoever walks in, and you all know the story that our Prophet ﷺ walked in. And what is amazing, as Ibn Ishaq and others mentioned, all the tribes became happy. 
Because otherwise, it would not have been possible for all the tribes to be happy. Only the tribe that that person belonged to would have been happy. But when they saw the Prophet ﷺ, they all became happy because every tribe thought, the Prophet ﷺ likes me so much, he's actually going to choose my tribe. And so, as you all know the story, the Prophet ﷺ instantaneously, he said, bring me a sheep, an izar, an upper garment. When it was brought, the Prophet ﷺ himself put it on the izar, put it on the garment, and he said, let every sub-tribe send its representative, send its chieftain, send your guy, and all of us will put it simultaneously. And so they all lifted it, so the Banu Makhzum, they fulfilled their promise because they were a part of those who lifted. So they didn't break their promise of fighting to the death, they fulfilled it. And all the tribes fulfilled it, and as you know, the Prophet himself was the one who put it into that particular location.